happy to have you here and have our wonderful featured readers here and our poetic opener. I'm happy to have some folks here joining us on Zoom. Um, let's get back to the poetry. Um, so I'll start by introducing Joey Scarfone, who is our poetic opener of the evening. Um, Joey has written lyrics for songs all his life, but over the last two years, he's been focusing on short stories and putting poetry over artwork. And I was just looking at some of his uh, poem over artwork pieces, and they're gorgeous. Um, the pandemic has forced his creativity into the comic format titled Pandemic Fatigue, which this says it's ongoing, but I think maybe he's moved on right now. Maybe. I don't know. Worry about that. <laughs> He'll tell you more about that. Um, please welcome Joey Sparecombe. <laughs> And I think this is good. Like this. There we are. Good evening. Yes, I have been working on comment for the last two years. I found it was a good way to process my own anxieties uh, about this whole pandemic, which sort of hit astronomical levels. I've never really felt anxiety that much as I have the last couple of years. <laughs> However, after doing a little more than 50 panels, um, I'm just not doing it anymore, simply because it's just getting too overwhelming. And with things opening up a bit, um, I don't feel as much anxiety. Um, however, the first poem I'm going to read is called Desperate Dogs, which I wrote in the first, I think, first couple months. And one of the many sociological things that happened was people started banging pots and pans at seven o'clock. And first I, I would go for a walk and I would see people up in their balconies and think, wow, isn't this something? And I think it started out as a, a thank you to the healthcare workers, but then it grew into this frustrating, from a release of the frustrations, I think. Um, so anyways, this first uh, poem is called Desperate Dogs. Gray sky blocking the sun. Streets are deserted, but there's nowhere to run. The first day of spring seems like the last day of fall, and the desperate dogs are watching it all. They watch from the markets that have emptied their shelves, they watch from the shops that are closed. They watch from their balconies, afraid for themselves. They watch from their kids who need clothes. It happened so fast, like wind through the trees. No one knew what was going on. The whole human race was brought to its knees. Something was really wrong. So the dogs stayed home, because being alone was the only thing they could do. They needed a plan, or maybe Superman would help them make it through. Through the war they've never fought before, through the losses they would endure, through the jobs that aren't there anymore, through the hope they'd find a cure. And then the dogs did what they do best. They went for a walk and started to talk and eventually got a grip. The desperate dogs howled at the moon and got on board with the trip. And this I should say is from my book, Jaded Dinosaurs jaded dinosaurs <laughs> um, and there is a small club of writers uh, that i've started called the jaded dinosaurs club one of the uh, mandates is you have to be around the age of 70 or have at least one near-death experience in your life <laughs> um this next song this next song I'm here to sing. This, next, <laughs> this next poem um, is about a fictitious, uh, a fictitious limo service. It's called Midnight Messiah, and I got the idea from that movie uh, Light Sleeper with Willem Dafoe. Um, they were cocaine dealers, and every time they had to do a deal, they would phone the limo. So they had their own limo guy delivering them. Midnight Messiah. Midnight Messiah, work until dawn. The sun's coming up and the drugs are coming on. 
He'll take you wherever your heart desires. Next stop, the promised land. Close your eyes, let it be a surprise. And he does it all with a wave of his hand. You're not the first to take this cruise and you sure won't be the last. But just for now, he'll show you how it'll really be a gas. Midnight Messiah, ahead of his time, living up to his name. For a nominal fee, he'll set you free and you'll never be the same. So hold on tight because it's a bumpy flight. But don't worry, he's never crashed. You're doing just fine. Have a glass of wine. You want to smoke some hash? Behold, he says, the rising sun as he slows the limo down. I know every corner and all night bar in this godforsaken town. I've seen it all and now it's time to show it all to you. You've paid me well and I can tell your journey's almost through. Here's my card if you ever want to take another ride. The Midnight Messiah is always here and happy to oblige. Midnight Messiah, work until dawn, making your dreams come true. It's been a gas, you went first class, and it's been a pleasure knowing you. And this one is about one of my favorite birds. It's called the crows. And I also put this one on a card. They sit on the hydro wires like punk rockers in the cheap seats at a concert. Fashion isn't their thing. No pretty color feathers or sweet songs. They wear black leather and black leather only. Their song is a raunchy blues with a smoker's cough. That's why I like the crows, no pretenses. You won't see them gliding up to some silly bird feeder like those social climbing sparrows. They'll eat leftover pizza from last night's hockey game. No wonder they don't have the energy to migrate. Instead, they brave the winter in their skinny jackets, huddling together like street smart ethnic gangs. Body heat is all they need. I admire crows, they're tough. They can survive in the city or the jungle. Same difference, it's survival. We'll never see a crow immortalized on a coin or a stamp. There won't be a portion of wetland set aside for their preservation because they don't need the advertising. They're already famous. Refusing to become extinct, they dictate their terms to evolution. Pick on the spotted owl, stick it to the bald eagle, but don't mess with us crows. We are here forever. Thank you. Thank you, Joey. They don't need the advertising. I love that. Um, okay. Uh, so, our featured reader, Ellie Sawatsky, is a writer from Kenora, Ontario, and now Vancouver, um, a finalist for the 2019 Bronwyn Wallace Award and the recipient of CB2's 2017 Foster Poetry Prize. Her work has been published in literary journals such as Grain, The Fiddlehead, The Puritan, and Room. And um, None of This Belongs to Me is her debut poetry collection. Um, and you know I like to do a little research about poets before they come, so I found this a quote from an interview with the British Columbia Review, formerly the Ormsby Review, um, and she said, Poetry embraces ambiguity, allows for multiple contradictory truths, a certain fluidity of being. Loneliness is good and bad. The child is mine and not mine. It's almost comforting to admit my regrets or wishes in a poem almost a way of bringing them to life or making them a part of my reality. In this space, hard truths feel softer. I love that. And I'm very excited to welcome Ellie Sawatsky. Come on up. Thank you. Is that good for me? Yeah, yeah that's okay. Give it a pull if it's not right where you need it. Okay. Hi. Hello. <laughs> um, it's so lovely to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, first of all, I just want to say thank you to Zoe and Leanne and the whole um, Planet Earth Poetry community. 
Um, I know from experience how much hard work goes on behind the scenes of, of a reading series and an organization like this. And um, I'm just so happy and grateful that you're out here doing this good work in the name of poetry. Um, so, so lovely to be here and to be doing an in-person reading. The last one I did was in November as so my book launch, which I was very fortunate to be able to do in person. And so this is great. Um, so I'm going to read some poems from my debut book, this book, None of This Belongs to Me, um, which just came out in October with Nightwood. Um, and I'll start with a poem that I always like to open readings with because it speaks to what it means to me to be a poet. It's called Poetry Wants My Imaginary Boyfriends. Truth rambles some Moorish in between, but that's poetry. Poetry wants obsidian, Pierrot, lion, grade nine. I called myself oak tree, insufferable. With my first flesh and blood boyfriend confused by the blocky awkwardness of love, a mix of tenderness and blueberry vodka, his dad's house on the lake, hot box bathroom, Bed upstairs where I ditched the social construct of virginity listening to Radiohead. Should have left it behind the percussion instruments in the music room, timpani slowly untuning, or better yet, to the girl painting murals in the next town over. Should have sabotaged every relationship, touched magic, moonrise, traveled to Barcelona and gotten laid. Or I should still be a virgin. Poetry wants my awkwardness and smooth slip into promiscuity, wants me to malfunction perfectly forever. Lucky, this splitting pain is in the name of something. Lucky, poetry wants my ache and ache and a thumb lost to frostbite. Poetry wants to shake things up, break it off, cut my hair, sell my eggs so I might have children in the world, mine, not mine, at the same time. Poetry wants those children to find me. Um, I wasn't planning on reading this poem tonight, but um, I was inspired by Leanne's beautiful poem from the open mic. So this is called, What Blue? What blue do you have? My grandmother asks me. She thinks we're sisters, herself, my mother, me. This road we've taken 10,000 times, a now foreign corridor through wild dog haunted woods, the machinery of trees. From the back seat, she asks again about my eyes. She asks again where we're going, to the lake. With grandfather dead, we are three single women, sisters, girls, absorbing the mysteries of the world, comparing blues. Hers, the hue of almost supper time, men's shadows at the edges of the fields, and mother in the farmhouse kitchen making borscht. Mine, more like morning, milkweed, ladder shadow, crow. Another sister on the way again, another emotional labor. Providence, then, nuance of blue over quilts of flax, now over oak trees. Grandmother behind me says, are you looking? Women, we're always looking. Last 10 miles, our intuitions tell us the dusk's about to get gruff. We'll be soaked unloading the car. Our minds will go. The horizon is another color we know. Um, this next poem, I was also not planning on reading tonight. <laughs> but it was requested by my friend, Emily, who's here tonight. And I love her request. So this is Look at Your Life, You'll See Emily's. Emily's in ice skates, casting circles on the lake, skipping Sunday school for kittens, uttering tampon and bra like pencil while you still swallow the words. Emily's make molehills of snowbanks, jump in juniper, offer goat's milk, cocoa, heather smoke and breath fog yawning on the boardwalk. Emily's at 18 holds your hair, holds your hand through cemeteries, piercings, when your father is sick, 
Some Emilys drive Civics. Some Emilys are Emily with two E's and little, or they're tall, scald their throats with whiskey, get excited, settle down. Some Emilys incite poetry festivals, impersonate Alanis, teach dance as magic expression, shaking hurt from their hips. So many Emilys, plucky millennials, shifting wild-minded, they rock climb, sew costumes for their cross-dressing husbands, tend the land black-handed in marsh boots. Emilys cry on Skype. Emilys bus tables, insert IUDs, feed geese, forget to eat. Emilys hunt ghosts, shovel snow, get nervous in crowds, quietly paint highland cows. Emilys casting circles, Emilys amassing, gifting apples to a fire. So um, I grew up in Kenora, Ontario. <laughs> <laughs> Represent Northwestern Ontario. Um, but I've lived in Vancouver the last 12 years or so. So my book follows a bit of a coming of age chronology. And one of the sections in kind of the middle is a series of poems I wrote about working as a nanny over the last 10 years in Vancouver. Um, I started working as a nanny during my undergrad because it was a flexible job that paid relatively well, but it wasn't really one that um, I sought out. It kind of fell into my lap. Um, so the title of my book, None of This Belongs to Me, comes from one of those poems and speaks to a feeling that I think is really common among folks of my generation and younger generations of trying to get a foothold in the world while feeling largely disenfranchised. And also humbly, I hope, acknowledging that we're all just passing through. None of this belongs to any of us and none of this is permanent. So as a nanny, people always assumed that the child I was looking after was my child. And I was always saying, not mine, she's not mine. And that alongside being a renter in an expensive city and in general, a broke millennial <laughs> made me feel almost as though I was defined by that, which did not belong to me. In any case, at one point, the family that I was working for um, in Kitsilano asked me to go to Burning Man with them as their nanny. And that was something that I said yes to so that I could write a poem about it later. <laughs> so this is called, This Little Girl Goes to Burning Man. And it opens with an, uh, a quote, an epigraph from the Burning Man Guide. A leave no trace ethic is very simple. Leave the place you visit the same as or better than you found it. This little girl is one, two, three. We count mountain goats from the RV window, the spread open wings of dragon trees and brittle blue shrubs as they dwindle to one over there and then none. Under paper white sky, it's two, two Tuesday. It's a day glow desert playground. She's a dust fairy in pink half blinking, never sits. Me, her nanny, mistaken for her mother. She's had less time than some to learn the horse-like unpredictability of love. Her mother runs free in beaded boots, a faux fur bikini, repeating love, her mantra, the word sounding in the black mountain valley or swallowed whole, a bell in a mossy hollow. This mother was three, then 43, in a flare of wildfire. She was a little girl wanting love. Her own mother loved the dog and a man who ran marathons. This little girl wants to see the man burn. Long into the black, ecstatic night, she's lighting matches while I lie awake in limbo, listening to little huffs of breath the threat of hooves outside, stirring up dust storms, the sound nearly drowned by drum funk thumping bass. This little girl's out dancing. This little girl's asleep. This little girl with turning uncertainty loves another little girl and the love leaves its trace, lit up like a glow stick, then slowly leaking esters into sand. So this next 
poem is um, a poem about my favorite time of year, which is Gemini season. So it's coming up. <laughs> um, it's like May, June. Um, things feel pretty grim in the world right now. Um, so this is kind of a hopeful apocalyptic poem, which I know is an oxymoron, but here we are. New moon, Gemini season. Someone on Instagram said, you can begin again. Across the city, the man I used to love is happy, likely, waxing metaphysical to his cats about the Illuminati. I'm feverish in bed, the internet feeding me little wisdoms. I don't believe in romance, a friend says in a text, and I protest. But these days, an ASM artist on YouTube pets me to sleep. The little boy I nanny says he sees ghosts. I guess I believe in unfinished business, like when the big one shakes us, I imagine I'll be high on cough syrup, rolling bad 90s movies in my mind and wishing I could call my mother, but lately I just ask Google. At least I know I'm not the first person to have wondered anything. Wiki, how can I begin again if I'm still haunted? How do I make peace with my ex who believed the flat earth theory? Fell asleep each night listening to lectures by a man known as Mr. Astrotheology. I hated that NASA loomed monstrous outside our house, that even love might have been a conspiracy. We circled each other. For so many years, I saw my Saturn returning and a so-called anti-moon finally shadowed him from me. I'm wide awake now, even in sleep. I'm busy building catastrophes. Last night's nightmare, a gym floor littered with thumbtacks, many barefoot children. But hope this evening is a post-Tinder codeine dream where I see two of me make love to each other while the earth quakes. I believe this is the beginning of something. I'm going to read one more. Um, in preparation for this reading, I was trying to remember the last time that I came to Victoria, which amazingly I think was 2016, which is so long ago. Um, but my parents were visiting from Ontario at the time and we came to Victoria um, for a weekend or something. And it was kind of a momentous trip because it was the first time I ever smoked a joint with my parents. And <laughs> if you knew my parents, you would know that, that was like a big deal. Um, so very memorable. So my book is dedicated to my parents and my siblings and my family really features in it. So I wanted to read a poem that celebrates where I came from, which is Kenora. Um, so when I'm in Kenora in my childhood home, um, my childhood home is in unorganized territory, meaning it's not connected to a municipality. So the weather app on my phone says I'm in Kenora, comma, unorganized. <laughs> and the Tinder app back when I was a Tinder dater said that I was in null, comma, Ontario. <laughs> so I wrote this poem about being from null, Ontario. Kenora, unorganized. The pipes freeze, car won't start. Dad splits wood and mom conmaries the closets to make space for me. I borrow Sorrel's shovel hopeless trenches through the unorganized territory of my childhood. This minus 50 has some mercy, says CBC, meaning death for larvae of the emerald ash borer, a pretty but evil invasive beetle that kills trees. Blessed is the junko at the feeder, who's not supposed to be here this time of year. Blessed also the unlikely swallowtail butterfly found alive in a local man's garage. I've come here to collect stories from my ancestry, but I keep procrastinating. Watch my mind chase a jackrabbit across the frozen lake, which is a kind of cemetery. In Null, Ontario, you can hear the snap as tinder breaks. Radio waves roll into an empty sky. There's no one around you. Evening, I rewatch Matilda with my parents, remembering a man I once loved who wept passionately when we watched together. He so believed in telekinesis. 
natural history, strange and miraculous, thistle seeds stirring under snow. Loneliness is its own magic, the way the earth makes room. Mom flicks off lights so we can see the wolf moon turn red behind a quiet grove of ash trees. Thank you.